Hello, my name is Dr. Joel Brenner. I'm the medical director for the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters Sports Medicine Program and the director of the CHKD Sports Concussion Program. Today, I'd like to talk to you about concussion in student athletes and give a practical update for parents and school coaches. Um, if at any point you have questions along the way, um, we do have a website which we'll show you, and you can always contact us via our uh, phone number at 668-PLAY. The goals for today are to review the definition, the diagnosis, and management recommendations regarding concussions in student athletes. First question always is, what is a concussion? I'd like to show you a video here of one of the most famous concussions in the past couple of years of Tim Tebow. Taylor Wyndham, what we can see here is uh, he gets hit. Penalty. If you look at the back of his head, it's uh, with the other that player's head. Hit. Took it right square in the chest, Mark. The entire that is a uh, one way that a concussion occurs. So the definition that we like to use actually comes from the CDC. And concussion has been defined as a complex process that affects the brain. It's caused by a traumatic force, either directly to the head or even indirectly when someone gets hit in the body. And it disrupts the function of the brain. So it doesn't cause any structural problems. It's nothing we can see on a CAT scan or an MRI. And it doesn't have to be a real hard or spectacular hit where someone in the audience goes, ooh, ah, um, but it can be a very minor traumatic force. Oftentimes people will say they got their bell rung or a ding, but the most important thing to realize is that it's a brain injury. How often do sports concussions occur in the United States? It's estimated to be about 4 million sports-related concussions each year, and only about 10% actually lose any consciousness. So most concussions do not have a loss of consciousness. This slide here shows the signs and symptoms that are commonly observed and commonly reported by um, athletes. And we can see over on this first column the, the signs that are observed by coaching staff or other personnel. Um, oftentimes the athlete might appear dazed or stunned or just kind of not feeling out or seeming out of it. They're confused. They might not really understand their plays. They might be kind of responding a little bit slowly. Um, there is a chance they could lose consciousness. They might be actually acting differently. So someone who's normally um, very rambunctious might be very quiet. And they might have some memory problems, either not remembering what happened before or what happened after the event. The athlete might present with a variety of different symptoms. Most commonly is headache. About 80% of athletes with concussions will have a headache. But they might just be dizzy. They might have uh, sensitivity to light and noise, which might be bothering them. They oftentimes have problems concentrating and problems with their memory, either during uh, the actual acute event or even later on when they're in school. And they might often be confused. But all these symptoms don't occur with every concussion, and every concussion is individual. The first tip we want to leave you with today is do not assume that if an athlete did not lose consciousness, they do not have a concussion. And the mantra should always be, if in doubt, sit them out. This uh, slide shows a variety of different grading scales that have been developed over the past couple decades. The good thing to know is that we no longer use any grading scales. These have been thrown out and are not used by the medical community. The uh, two most recent resources that have been put out there that are used by the medical community include, in 2008, the Zurich Consensus Guidelines about concussions, and also in 2010, the American Academy of Pediatrics have published sports-related uh, concussion in children and adolescents. And uh, these are freely available on the internet if you want to uh, find more uh, information about this uh, topic. The action plan for coaches are included in this slide. And the first thing is that you need to suspect that a student athlete has a concussion. So you need to be thinking about it. If you suspect that they have a concussion, and not necessarily that you've diagnosed it, the first thing to do is remove the athlete from play. And then you should notify the athletic trainer um, if they're available on site. Um, and then you should notify the parents of the student athlete. If the athletic trainer is not available at that time, the 
um, athletes should be referred to their primary care provider or an emergency department. And the athlete should only be allowed to return to play with written medical clearance. This form here is the, called the SCAT-2 or the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool, a tool that's commonly used on field by athletic trainers and physicians and other healthcare providers who are on site. The follow-up evaluation should consist of multiple components and it should occur during the acute period of the injury. Um, the first part should be reviewing the signs and symptoms, um, the signs and symptoms that we had reviewed earlier uh, on a previous slide. Also going through a complete neurologic exam, some form of balance testing, and then some form of neuropsychological exam or neurocognitive test. One form is a computer test called IMPACT. There are a variety of other computer tests um, that are available. Question always comes up, what do we see on an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI with a concussion? And this is what we would see, just a normal brain, normal skulls. Um, concussions do not show up on an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI. So if a CAT scan is performed on a student athlete with a concussion and it's normal, that tells us that there's no fracture, that tells us that there's no bleeding in the brain, but it doesn't tell us anything about a concussion. Well, how do we use neuropsychological testing in the treatment and the management of concussions? So we need to remember that concussion is a clinical diagnosis. And unlike broken bones that we can see here or ACL tears, there's no definitive way to directly image or see a concussion. So neuropsychological testing does not make the diagnosis of a concussion and it does not rule one out. It is just one tool in the toolbox. For the Chesapeake Public Schools, the um, students who are at high risk sports are required to take baseline tests prior to participating. And these sports are listed here on this slide. If we see on this slide here, we can see that when a concussion occurs at time zero, that the symptoms will gradually resolve to include either headache, dizziness, nausea, or other symptoms. If we then look at the uh, neurocognitive testing, we can see <clears throat> that the neurocognitive deficits in terms of memory and reaction time might persist further in time when symptoms have resolved. Therefore, symptoms may resolve earlier than neurocognitive deficits, especially in young athletes. Well, how quick do young high school athletes recover? A study out of Pittsburgh showed that 40% of young athletes are better in week one, 60% by two weeks, and 80% by three weeks. But that means that one in five or 20% might take longer than three weeks to get better. We also know that children recover slower than adults, and so we cannot treat children and young athletes the same as adult athletes. When can these young athletes return to play? This slide shows the criteria for return to play. First, the athlete needs to be completely asymptomatic without any signs or symptoms. They need to have a normal neurologic exam. They need to have a normal balance testing and their neuropsychological or neurocognitive exam needs to be back to baseline or their presumed baseline. And then when all those criteria are met, then they can start on a return to play progression. The return to play progression, as outlined on this slide, starts with no activity. When the athlete is still symptomatic, they are to have physical and cognitive rest, which we'll talk about. Once they are back to where they can start this progression, they can then start with light aerobic exercise, moving on to sport specific exercise, then on to non-contact training drills, full contact practice, and then returning to game play. Each step of the way should be a minimum of 24 hours, and there needs to be monitoring for any recurrence of the signs or symptoms or problems that may have occurred. If there are any problems along the way, they need to stop and then restart at a previous level. This return to play progression needs to be monitored by an athletic trainer or other healthcare provider. 
The uh, treatment for concussion is outlined on this slide here. The cornerstone of treatment for a concussion is rest, both cognitive and physical rest. When the brain suffers a concussion, the brain is in an energy crisis, and we need to limit the energy used uh, for other matters to allow the brain to heal. So cognitive rest involves helping with academic accommodations, whether that means limiting the time going to school, staying home from school for a couple days, or just limiting homework or other tests. And that needs to be an individual approach that's coordinated with the school and with the parents and with the athlete. That also means limiting screen time in terms of the internet, in terms of texting, in terms of TV, and other things that uses brain's energy. Physical exertion means basically just resting, trying to lay low, not doing any running, jumping, or other sporting activities, and allowing the brain to heal. The other thing we want to do is avoid a second hit to the brain that can cause uh, tremendous um, and uh, permanent problems that we'll talk about. So when a student athlete is resting, they need to avoid certain activities that might cause another hit to the brain, such as riding a bike, rock climbing, or other activities that might not be thought about. Sleep's probably the most important medicine um, that allows the brain to heal. We need to make sure that all young student athletes get as much sleep as possible. And then these other three bullets on the slide are things that are sometimes used in individual cases, including medication, physical therapy, or psychotherapy when it's been going on for an extended period of time. Medication won't allow the brain to heal faster, but might help with some of the symptoms so that the athlete can rest. The treatment and care of a young athlete with a concussion has to be a multidisciplinary team, as we see on this slide. And it includes the athletic trainer, a physician, an athlete, and the parent, along with the school to include the coach, the nurse, and other school personnel. And it may include a sports medicine physician or a neuropsychologist or a neurologist or a neurosurgeon if needed in certain cases. Why are we taking all these precautions? What are we trying to prevent? One of the things we want to prevent is post-concussion syndrome. We hear a lot about this. Post-concussion syndrome is easily defined as when a concussion and the symptoms of a concussion last longer than might be expected. Second impact syndrome is a rare phenomenon, but it had only been documented to occur in young athletes less than 21. And it occurs when you have a brain injury and you get a second brain injury before your brain's healed and it's felt to cause brain swelling, which can cause permanent brain damage or even death in rare occasions. Now, it is rare, but it's also very preventable, and that's why we're taking these precautions. The third problem that we're trying to prevent that we've been learning more about is called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. And we can see here on this slide, these are autopsy results. On the left is a healthy brain, and on the right is a damaged brain, and this is actually the brain of an 18-year-old who suffered from multiple concussions. And this would be similar to the brain of a 75-year-old with dementia. <clears throat> I'd like to show you this video from the CDC that shows a, a young athlete who talks about her experience. And this video is also available on the Internet. It was January 10, 2005. I was 17 years old and my high school basketball team was playing a varsity game and it was around the second quarter and I was going up for a rebound and as I came down um, the back of my head collided with the top of another girl's head. The next day after the day I got hit I went to school and I was really sick I knew I had a concussion because I suffered through a concussion my seventh grade year. I had all the symptoms dizzy, nauseous, um, I couldn't focus in school I continued to play a second game after that, and I passed out after the second game in the locker room. Basically, I was bedridden in my house for about six months straight. I slept on the couch because of the light. We had to put dark shoes over the windows. Um, my mom and my sister had to help me walk around. Um, I lost my balance. I couldn't really get that back for quite a while. I didn't know it could get this bad. All athletes 
have a strong will and since we're young we know that we have to suck it up suck things up whether you know you sprain your ankle or you hurt your finger you just go in the game and you shake it off and you don't complain you don't cry but this is a brain and head we're talking about and you can't suck it up so unfortunately instead of missing a game I missed the season I missed sports for the rest of my life and I missed out on a great life that I could have had Athletes need to know, if you think you have a concussion, don't hide it. Report it. It's better to miss one game than the entire season. You can find information on concussions at www.cdc.gov slash concussion and youth sports. In the state of Virginia, a new law went into effect July 1, 2011 um, on the policies of concussions in student athletes. And the law in essence stated that there needs to be education of parent, athlete, and coaches each year and there needs to be proof of that education. If an athlete is suspected of having a concussion, they need to be removed from play. There needs to be written clearance by a licensed health care provider and the licensed health care provider may be a volunteer. Again, to review the action plan for a coach is that if you suspect a student athlete has a concussion, that athlete should be removed from play immediately. The certified athletic trainer should be notified. The parents should be notified. The athlete should be referred to the primary care provider or an emergency department if the certified athletic trainer is not available. And that athlete should only be allowed to return to play with written medical clearance. Again, if in doubt, sit them out. This is a website here is available with many useful tools and videos and information that could be printed out. If you go to chkd.org slash concussion, um, you'll be able to uh, find that. Again, if there's any information or questions that come up along the way, feel free to contact us at 668-PLAY. Thank you very much.